الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل الله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده 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 لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وسندنا ونبينا وشفينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون عن ابي هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من لم يدع قول الزور والعمل به فليس لله حاجة أن يدع طعامه وشرابه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما وارزقني فهما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وكلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اونرب العلماء respected brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it is merely only the favor of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah the almighty not only made us ashraf ashraf al makhluqat the best of all creations Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went on and favored us more and he made us believers, he made us Muslims. So from amongst all of types of creations, he made us humans which are regarded as ashraful makhluqat, the best of creations. And then he didn't just leave it there, but he favored us more and he made us believers, he made us Muslims. Believers in Allah and believers in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today has favored us, one, has gone one step further and fa favored us more. That he enabled us, he gave us the ability, the tawfiq to perform our salah, our asr salah with jamaat. And we are sitting here in this noble gathering today. So the more grateful we be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us. La in shakartum la azidannakum. If you will make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you will be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounties He has bestowed upon you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you more. There is no doubt in the fact. But if you look at all the religions across the whole world today, Islam is the most authentic religion and is the true religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in the Quran wherein he says, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ That anybody who seeks another religion besides Islam, then on the day of judgment, this religion for this person will be of no benefit. It will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just, it will not just be accepted and it will not be of any benefit. In fact, this religion for this person will be a means of loss. Allah is saying. So we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has given us the gift of Islam. And he has made us Muslims. Imam Hakim relates in his Mustadrak 
on the authority of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says that one day we were sitting with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, the inna Allah yu'ti ad-deena man yuhibbu wa man la yuhibbu. Inna Allah yu'ti ad-dunya man yuhibbu wa man la yuhibbu. Walakinna ad-deena illa man yuhibbu wa fi riwayatin walakinna al-eemana illa man yuhibbu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives power, gives wealth, gives this world to those people that he loves and to those people that who, who he does not love. But Islam, this deen of Islam, an iman, according to another narration, Allah only gives to those people who he loves. So we are Muslims and we are sitting in the masjid today. This is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has love for us. Allah loves us. This is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The verse of the Quran which I recited before you. It's a verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. And in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Mulana Sahib before me mentioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the fasting, mentions the month of Ramadan in this verse of the Quran. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. If you look closely in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to address the people, He has used two different types of addresses. Either He has said, Ya ayyuhal nas, when He says, Ya ayyuhal nas, that means the whole humanity, whether it's a believer or whether it's a non believer. Or the other address of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is specific to the believers that he has used is Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who believe. Dr. Abdul Hayy Arafi rahimahullahu ta'ala who was from amongst our pious predecessors he was a disciple of the great Hakimul Ummah Hazrat Mawlana Shafali Tanwi rahimahullahu ta'ala who is probably the greatest scholar of the 14th century and the greatest reformer of the 14th century. Dr. Abdul Hayy Arafi rahimahullah ta'ala says that wherever in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used these words Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who believe This address alone carries great importance carries great love and great affection And then he explains He says the reason for this is that if you look at this address closely you will notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you and I that Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who believe, O you Muslims Allah is using our relationship with Him in this address and what is our relationship with Allah? It's a relationship of belief we believe in the oneness of Allah using this relationship expressing this relationship within this address Allah is saying to you and I, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who believe. Let me give you an example. When a father, he calls his son for something. You know, he says, Zakariya, come here. Asad, come here. Yahya, come here. Yusuf, come here. The son doesn't feel very important. He doesn't feel honored. He doesn't feel any love and affection. Because everybody calls him by that name. But when the father says to him, you know, when he mentions him, he says to him, Oh my son, come here. Oh my son, come here. Listen to what I'm about to say. Or do this for me. When the father says, Oh my son, now you watch that son. His his chest swells. He's so proud of himself. You know, he feels so much love. He feels so much affection. You know, you can see, it, literally, you could see a six-pack coming up. <laughs> I went to, a, I had a talk a few months ago on the Dajjal. And I was talking about, you know, everything about the Dajjal in the talk. So afterwards, this youngster comes up to me and he goes to me, Sheikh, you know, you mentioned in the physical description of the Dajjal, you mentioned that the Jal is going to be a man who is going to be really built. You know, he's going to really have a huge body. 
So he goes to me, Sheikh, is he going to have a six pack? <laughs> I go to him, forget six pack, this guy is going to have a 12 pack. So you need to go to the gym <laughs> and work harder. Anyway, slightly off the topic. So when the father says to his son, oh my son, beta come here. You know, he feels so much pride. He feels so much love and affection. And he knows that what my father is about to tell me now carries great importance. Similarly, wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, what Allah is about to say now carries great importance. And there is great love and affection in this address of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So using this, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, Allah says, Kutiba alaykum as-suyam. That I have prescribed fasting upon you. I have prescribed fasting upon you. Some of you today, you know, I've already been hearing, last few weeks I've been hearing people, you know, they're saying, Sheikh, this Ramadan is going to be a killer. You know, you know, how many hours? Maghrib, what time is Maghrib? Half nine Maghrib. You know, this Ramadan is going to be the toughest of all time. You know, hearing all these things. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is because of these things. Because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, to give us comfort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have prescribed fasting upon you, but it's not something which is impossible. Kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. Nations that came before you also fasted. So I am not giving you a task which is impossible to do. It's possible to fast. Regardless of how many hours it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made us mukallaf. Allah has not ordered to us to do anything which is beyond our capabilities and beyond our powers. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. So to give us comfort, Allah is saying that I have prescribed fasting upon you, but don't worry, people that came before you, nations that came before you, they fasted also. A nation that came before us fasted also. Fasting was incumbent upon them also. But the nature of their fasting, the timing of their fasting, the whole nature of their fasting uh, differed from every nation. But fasting was incumbent upon them as well. Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam. He would fast three days every month. Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu was salam, when he went to the Mount of Tur to receive the Tawrat, he fasted for 40 days. Hazrat Isa alayhi salatu was salam, in the jungle he fasted for 40 days. Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salatu was salam, he fasted. He made his followers fast also. So fasting was incumbent on the nation that came before us. Allah has not given us a task which is impossible. It's a possible task. Now why do we fast? What is the objective of fasting, O oh Allah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La allakum tattaqoon. I have prescribed fasting upon you so that you may attain taqwa. You may attain taqwa. You know, a lot of people translate taqwa as God-fearing or the fear of Allah. But in reality, this is an incorrect translation of the word taqwa. The word taqwa includes many meanings. You know, it's a, there isn't, unfortunately, there isn't a word in English, a comprehensive word in English to translate the word taqwa. Yes, fear of Allah is a part of taqwa, but also to avoid anything which causes the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is included in taqwa also. To live our lives in accordance to the sunnah, to live our lives in accordance to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is taqwa also. It includes many meanings. Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he once asked, the great Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala knew that, Oh Abdullah, tell me what is taqwa? And Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala knew, he explained to Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab what taqwa is in a beautiful example. He gave a beautiful example to explain. He said to him, Oh Umar, you are walking on a path and that path is full of thorns and it's full of pricks. How are you going to walk on that path? You will walk in such a manner 
on your right, on your left, there's thorns everywhere. It's a dangerous path. You will walk in such a way, saving yourself. You will walk carefully, ensuring that no prick pricks you. Ensuring that these thorns don't harm you in any way. Ensuring that anything harmful on this path does not harm you. Similarly, O Umar, we as Muslims, when we are born, this is taqwa. When we are born, from here right up till Jannah, it's full of sins. And it's full of harmful things. So we save ourselves. We live our lives in such a way that we keep saving ourselves from these sins on the right and these sins on, on, our, on the left. And we reach our destination. One who reaches the destination successfully is going to be successful in the hereafter. This is what taqwa is, O Umar. A beautiful example he gave Allah. So taqwa is everything. You know, everything a person does, anything a person does to avoid in any way the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Avoid anything that causes the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that causes the wrath of Allah, that causes the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fall down on the person. Whether that's you know, a person's own deeds, or whether that's your conduct with other people. So this is what taqwa is. And this is the objective of fasting, so that at the end of the month of Ramadan, you may attain taqwa. But it's unfortunate today, we see all around us today, Ramadan comes and goes, Ramadan comes and goes. First and foremost, we have no preparation for Ramadan whatsoever. Mentally or physically, we have not prepared for Ramadan. I mean, so shocking, some people, you know, the month of Ramadan is here and they don't even know the month of Ramadan is here. You know, and then last minute, everybody starts texting, oh, is it Ramadan tomorrow? Is it Ramadan tomorrow? Look at the Sahaba, look at the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The narration say that six months, how many? Six months before the month of Ramadan, the Sahaba would start making dua. This was their preparation. They would start making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, O oh Allah, keep us alive and grant us the strength and grant us the ability so that we may reach the month of Ramadan. So that we can witness the month of Ramadan. So that we can partake from the blessings of the month of Ramadan. For six months they would make this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Allah keep us alive. We want to be a part of the month of Ramadan. And then six months after the month of Ramadan, they would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That oh Allah, whatever ibadat, whatever worship, whatever good deeds that we did in the month of Ramadan, accept these from us. For six months. And look at our state today. Ramadan is here and we don't even know there's no preparation done. Preparation for the food has been done. Preparation for iftaris have been done. Preparation for the sahris have been done. If you open the fridge, you know, the food will fall out. So much preparation has been done when it comes to the stomach. But spiritually, how much preparation have we done for the month of Ramadan? This is the question. Spiritually. Are we, say, are we safeguarding ourselves from backbiting? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the hadith which I recited in the khutbah in the sermon which was being related by Imam Bukhari in his sahih on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that مَن لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ That a person who cannot shun evil a, per a person who cannot let go of doing evil, a person who cannot let go of talking falsehood, of backbiting, of sinful talk, then Allah has no need for this person to shun fasting, to shun uh, uh, food and drink. There is no need. A person goes hungry. A person goes without, is hungry, is fasted all day. He goes without water, he's thirsty. But throughout the day he's been backbiting. Throughout the day he's been involved in sinful talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have no need for such fasting. There is no need for this person to go without food or to go without drink. So each one of us needs to look, out, to look into ourselves. That how much effort have we made, how much preparation have we made for the month of Ramadan?
If somebody has a habit of sinful talk, if somebody has a habit of backbiting, then what measures have we taken? Have we implemented any measures to prevent ourselves from backbiting? To prevent ourselves from sinful talk, to prevent ourselves from lying? Why? Because these actions can be de detrimental to our fast. It can be detrimental to the month of Ramadan. Because what we need to get spiritually, the spiritual charge that a person gets from the month of Ramadan, if you're involved in all these sins, you will not attain it. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said in a narration, he said that when the month of Ramadan comes, إِذَا دَخَلَ رَمَضَانُ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ جَهَنَّمِ that as soon as the month of Ramadan comes, the gates of Jannah are flung open. And the gates of Jahannam are closed. And shayateen, the shayateen, the devils are put behind the bars. They are two orchestrators of our sins. Firstly, the devils, the shaitan. And secondly, our own nafs, our own selves, our own desires. These are the two orchestrators of our sins, of our everyday sins. Now during the month of Ramadan, Allah has made it easy for us. The shayateen, one orchestrator has been chained up. This orchestrator has been chained up, prison, barred. He will have no effect on you in the month of Ramadan now. He will not be able to make you commit sin now. So all you need to worry about now is about your own desires, controlling your own self. Controlling your own desires. Hakimul Ummah Tazid Mawlana Shabali Thanwi Rahimahullahu Ta'ala He gave an excellent prescription to all the Muslims. He says that whenever the month of Ramadan comes, just before the month of Ramadan, make an intention with your desires. Make an intention with your nafs. That all oh my nafs, make this deal with your nafs, that all oh my nafs, that during the month of Ramadan, we're not going to commit any sins whatsoever. Any sins. He says, if you will do this, and you genuinely try this, you genuinely do amal, you genuinely practice upon this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for you to stay away from sins during the month of Ramadan. And this amal alone, this practice alone will have so much blessings. That if you stay away from sins during the month of Ramadan, then you will feel its effects throughout the 11 months to come. So it will be easy for you to stay away from sins during the next 11 months also. During the next 11 months. During the next 11 months, it will be easy for you to stay away from sins. So we should all make this deal with our nafs before Ramadan from now. That all nafs from the, in the month of Ramadan, we're not going to commit any sins. Inshallah. Will you all make this intention with your nafs, inshallah? And then watch the blessings of this throughout the next 11 months, inshallah. After Ramadan, 11 months after that, Allah will make it easy for you, inshallah, to stay away from sin. Allah will make the controlling your nafs easy for you. Allah will make it easy for you when the shaitans are unleashed. Allah will make it easy for you to stay away from sin. So we should all make this intention, insha'Allah. The blessings of the month of Ramadan, there's very less time. But the blessings of the month of Ramadan, as you've heard from your scholars, as you've heard from the ulama. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran himself, in this same chapter, in this, on this same page, in fact, uh, mashallah, the beautiful recitation by the student, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. That Ramadan is a month wherein the Qur'an was revealed. Not just the Qur'an. But if you study the books of tafsir, the books on the commentaries of the Qur'an, you will come to know that every book of Allah was revealed during the month of Ramadan. On the first of Ramadan, scriptures upon Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam were revealed. On the 6th of Ramadan, the Torah was revealed upon Sayyidina Musa On the 12th of Ramadan, 
the Zabur was revealed upon Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu was salam. On the 18th of Ramadan, the Injil, the Bible was revealed upon Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam. And then according to one narration, on the 24th of Ramadan, and according to another narration, on the 27th of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, sent the Quran from the low mahfuz, from the preserved tablet up to the first sky. And then from here, as time required, as it was the demand, over a period of 23 years, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, would come down with some verses of the Quran. In fact, at times with the whole chapters of the Quran upon Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So all the books of Allah were revealed during the month of Ramadan. This is why Mujaddid al-Fisani rahimahullah ta'ala says that the month of Ramadan has a very special connection with the word of Allah. A very special connection. And he says all the books of Allah were revealed during this month. So we should make the most of reciting the Quran during this month. Make the most of it. And then he goes on to say that if you compare the blessings that fall during the month of Ramadan in comparison to the blessings that fall over the next 11 months, it is like a drop in the ocean. I like a drop in the ocean. So these blessings that fall for 11 months, for 11 months, not Ramadan, for 11 months, this is like that drop in the ocean. And the month of Ramadan, the blessings, this is the whole ocean. So many blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fall during the month of Ramadan. This is why our pious predecessors, during the month of Ramadan, they had a very special connection with the Quran. A very special connection. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, during the month of Ramadan alone, during the month of Ramadan alone, he would recite one complete recitation of the Quran in the morning, one complete recitation of the Quran in the evening. And then throughout the whole month of Ramadan, he would listen to three complete recitations of the Quran in Tarawih Salah. So if you calculate this, just in the month of Ramadan, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala had recited and had listened to 63 complete recitations of the Quran. 63 complete recitations of the Quran. <coughs> Sheikh Abdul Qadir Raipuri rahimahullah ta'ala from amongst our pious predecessors. It was his practice that in his khanqa, every 15th of Shaban, he would gather all his disciples, all his murids, and he would say to them, he would say to them that this is our last meeting now. I am not going to meet you till the end of the month of Ramadan now. And his special attendant, he would give him a bag, and he would say to him that if I get any mail, put it in this bag. Do not disturb me during the month of Ramadan. Give me this bag at the end of the month of Ramadan. Then I'll have a look at these letters. And such was the atmosphere in his Khanqa. That on the 19th of Shaban, the Khanqa was already full. The Khanqa was already full for the month of Ramadan. So if somebody wanted to come after the 19th of Shaban for Aitakaf, there was no place in the Khanqa. Such was the atmosphere. Read about what our pious predecessors, how they lived through the month of Ramadan. Like I mentioned earlier, six months before Ramadan, the Sahaba would make dua, that, oh Allah, keep us alive so we can witness the month of Ramadan. Six months after they would make dua, oh Allah, accept our ibadat, accept our good deeds that we have performed during the month of Ramadan. Not only that, but they would, they would train their children from a very early age. They would make their children fast. What do we do today? You know, if our child wants to fast today, say to him, Beta, you have to go to school in the morning. You're going to be tired. You know, you're not going to be able to handle it. You can't cope it. But look at the Sahaba, Allahu Akbar, the companions of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would make their children fast. And if the child started to cry out of hunger and out of thirst, the Sahaba, they would make toys for them. Just to entertain them, so their mind stays away from the hunger and from the thirst. Sheikh Zakaria rahimahullah ta'ala in Fazali Amal, in the portion concerning Hikayat Sahaba, the stories, the incidents of the Sahaba, he has mentioned such incidents. Now today our situation is this, that we read Fazali Amal. You know, many of us have mentioned this today and many of us are thinking, yeah, I remember that. 
ہے بیکاز وی ریڈنگ فضائل اعمال ٹوڈے وی ڈوئنگ تعلیم ٹوڈے بٹ اٹس بیکم اے کسٹم یو نو ول سی ان تعلیم فار فائیو ٹین منٹس جس فار دا سیک آف سٹنگ ڈاؤن یس ایون دا از فل آف بلیسنگس بٹ وین وی یو نو اسٹڈی دا انسیڈنس آف دا صحابہ اینڈ دا سیکریفائس آف دا صحابہ وین تھرو وی شوڈ ہیو سم سارٹ آف اے فیلنگ یو نو دا انسیڈنس یو نو دا حالات دیٹ دا صحابہ وین تھرو یو نو یو این آئی آر سو لکی 25 companions of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they migrated to India and it was through their efforts that we are Muslims today it was through their sacrifice that we are Muslims today it was the sahaba you read all the incidents in Fazali Amal Khabbab bin Arat radiyallahu ta'ala such a great companion of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the time of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu سیدنا عمر بن خطاب کول خباب اینی سیٹ ٹو ایم او خباب ٹیل می اباؤ وٹ یو پیپل ٹیل می اباؤ وٹ یو کمپنینز یو ارلی مسلمز وین تھرو ان دا ارلی ڈیز آف اسلام خباب بن ارت رضی اللہ تعالیٰ نے سیڈ عمر دس از ہاؤ وی ور ٹورچر اینڈ دین ہی مینشن سم آف دا انسیڈنس دا ہی وین تھرو دا ٹورچنگ دا وے دا قریش tortured the way the non-believers tortured Khabbab bin Arat radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He mentioned this to Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said that, Oh Khabbab, let me see your back. And why did he want to see the back of Khabbab bin Arat radiyallahu ta'ala anhu? Because Khabbab had accepted Islam. He had said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And because of this he was tortured. How was he tortured? He was placed on burning coal with his bare back. He can't even imagine it today. Burning coal. He was placed on this burning coal with his bare back. And the only thing that was there to extinguish that fire and that coal was the pus and the blood that would come out from his back. And then a man would come and he would place his foot on the chest of Khabbab so that he couldn't move. سیدنا عمر بن خطاب سیڈ او خباب لیٹ می سی یور بیک آئی وانٹ ٹو سی دی سائنس آف پرسیکیوشن آن یور بیک وین سیدنا خباب بن ارت رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ اللہ اکبر وین ہی لفٹڈ از کرتا ا پرسنالٹی لائک عمر بن خطاب رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ ہو واز نون فار از بریوری ہو واز نون فار از کوریج سو مچ سو دیٹ دا میسنجر آف اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم وانٹس کولڈ ہم ہی سیڈ او عمر Even the devils, even these jinns are so scared of you that when you are walking, these jinns and these shayateen, they run miles away from you because they are so scared of you. The day Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala accepted Islam, that day Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam, he came down from the heavens and he said, Ya Muhammad, laqad istabshara ahlu samai bi islami umar. That, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa today even the angels in the heavens are celebrating because Umar bin Khattab has accepted Islam. Such a great companion. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Law kana ba'di nabiyun lakana Umar ibn al-Khattab. That if there was to, to be a prophet to come after me, it would be Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is also reported to have said that every angel in the skies, every angel in the heavens loves Umar, respects Umar and every shaitan, every devil on this earth is scared and runs away from Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala and who has hatred for Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala and who. Such a great companion. He is known for his bravery, he is known for his courage. And when Khabbab bin Arat radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, when he lifted his kurta, and when Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, saw these signs of persecution in his back, it is said Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu began to scream. He couldn't take it. These are the sacrifices the sahaba went through. Ammar bin Yasir, whole family is tortured. Whole family. His father Yasir, accepts Islam. Abdullah, his brother, accepts Islam. Ammar accepts Islam. The mother, Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she accepts Islam also. Whole family accepted Islam. Abu Jahl couldn't take it. He went to their house at night time with a group. He took all four of them from their home. 
took them to the desert chained them down on the desert and began torturing them began torturing them huge rocks were placed on their chests on their bodies so that they couldn't move and in that sweltering heat allah akbar you can't even imagine it the ones who have been to hajj the ones who have been to umrah you'll know you know in the midday that sweltering heat you can't walk in it let alone stand in it or let alone be tied down into the desert and then the desert you know when the sun is the rays of the sun the heat of the sun is hitting the desert the desert becomes the sun becomes even more hot they are chained down and abu jahl has only one demand from them that leave muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam go back to the deen go back to the religion of your forefathers but these people allahu akbar they were so steadfast on iman they said to abu jahl you can do whatever you like but we are not going to leave the deen of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is walking past and he sees abu jahl he is torturing this family and yasir radiyallahu ta'ala anhu the father of ammar he says oh muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam how much more longer are we going to tolerate this for how much more longer are we going to bear this for when is the help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to come the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said sabran sabran ya ahla yasir fa inna mawidakum al janna be patient be patient o oh family of yasir indeed allah has promised you jannah these are the sacrifices the sahaba went through for deen just to stay on the kalima just to stay as believers just to recite the kalima la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah these are the sacrifices the sahaba went through and you and i today because we have got this religion in free because we have become muslims you know we born in muslim families by the age of 4 our parents have taught us the kalima we come to maktab we have taught we have been taught the qaida the ahsanul qawaid you know by the age of 7 and 8 you know the child goes on to the quran we are so lucky we should be grateful to allah subhanahu wa taala for what he has given us but because we are not grateful today and because we are not grateful to allah subhanahu wa taala and because we do not recognize how lucky we are we don't have any value for islam today this is why when the month of ramadan comes we don't have any value for the month of ramadan the sahaba valued every month of ramadan even the children valued the month of ramadan such are the blessings of the month of ramadan allahu akbar the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a lengthy khutbah you know in a lengthy sermon which was recited by molana sahab before me which has been related by ibn khuzaima in his sahih also by imam bayhaqi in his shawab al iman salman farsi radiyallahu ta'ala and he says one day the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw on his pulpit and he said khatabana rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam delivered a sermon and i won't go into it because molana sahab also uh, has already gone into it but i'll just mention one portion of it a very significant portion you know we living in a day today we living at a time today where you know if there's a sale you know if debenhams have got a sale on or if next have got a 75% sale on will queue up from before fajr time to get in at 9 o'clock you know some of you are laughing i think you've been there done that yeah you know we'll go and queue up there we'll sit there you know whole families go together you know and they'll take their you know pack lunches and everything and they'll sit in there eating and everything forget fajr salah they'll be there for that you know whether we come for fajr you know to perform our salah with jamaat forget that but they'll be there with next next sale you know they'll be there in town why because it's a sale you know you get pick up some bargains but it's unfortunate nowadays there's so many people as soon as you get in by the time in an hour everything's gone the bargains have gone anyway the sale of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the month of ramadan ramadan is a month it's a season for the believers you know how vendors and how businessmen every businessman has a season throughout the whole year and in this season they make the most money and if you look into their businesses and if you look into their you know their daily lives you will come to know that their effort throughout the whole year is geared towards this one season they'll make preparations all year so that they can maximize their profits in this season 
And when this season approaches, you will see a significant change in their everyday lives. Now, there's a change in their eating patterns. There's a change in their sleeping patterns. Now it's just, you know, eat, you know, sleep, no sleep, nothing, hardly any food. It's just work, work and work. Why? Because they want to make the most profit. They want to break the record of the previous year in this season. Similarly, as Muslims, the month of Ramadan is our season. Season for what? Season to attain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Season to attain the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the sale Allah has on for us. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in this hadith. Man taqarraba fihi bi khaslatin min al khayr. Kana kaman adda faridatan. That a person who during the month of Ramadan, a fasting person who carries out a voluntary act, a nafal act, or an act of sunnah during the month of Ramadan, he will be like that person, he will be rewarded like that person who has carried out an obligatory act, a farz act. And a person, woman adda faridatan. And that person who carries out one obligatory act during the month of Ramadan, he comes and performs his Zohar, which is obligatory. He comes and performs his Fajr, which is obligatory. Anybody who performs an obligatory act during the month of Ramadan, he will be rewarded as if he has performed 70 obligatory acts. 70% of sale by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do we come running for this to the masjid? No, we don't. But if there's a 75% sale or 70% sale in Nex or Debenhams, we're there. Look at the sale of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So make the most of this. Profit from the month of Ramadan. Profit from the month of Ramadan. Value this month of Ramadan as if it's your last Ramadan. Make preparations for the month of Ramadan. And start a clean slate. As soon as Ramadan comes, you know, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am a sinner. From top to bottom, I am full of sins. My whole life is full of sins. Oh Allah, forgive me. <coughs> you know, the common problem amongst our youngsters today. They think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive them for whatever they have done. I've spoken to many youngsters. I mean, alcoholics and druggies. And when you speak to them, their hearts begin to soften. But they always say one thing, which is a weapon of shaitan, because shaitan has attacked them. They say, Mullah Sahib, look, we are ready to change our lives. But we have drunk so much through our lives. We have been on drugs. We have committed zina, fornication, adultery. How is Allah ever going to forgive us? How is Allah ever going to forgive us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. The mercy of Allah knows no bounds. The mercy of Allah knows no bounds. There was a companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's an incident related by Abu Ya'la in his Musnad. He says that this companion whose name was Ma'iz bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have committed zina. I have committed fornication. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hears this and he turns his face away from him. So he says it again, Ya Rasulullah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have committed zina. Again the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns his face away. He says it the third time. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa turns his face away. Then the fourth time, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again turns his face away from him. When he said it the fifth time, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Azanita? That, oh Maiz, have you really committed adultery? Maiz bin Malik said, yes, oh Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You and I know that the punishment for a person who commits zina is come on test time a person who commits zina what's the punishment stoned to death a person who commits zina is stoned to death 
But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has been sent as وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ As a mercy for mankind. This is what he was sent for. He didn't just order that Maiz bin Malik be punished for his sin. But he wanted more clarification from Maiz. Because if he had ordered that Maiz bin Malik be stoned to death, what if it later on, it had been revealed that he didn't actually commit zina. He didn't actually commit the full act. Then what? So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, O Maiz, hal tadri ma zina? That, oh Maiz, do you know what zina is? Maiz bin Malik said, yes, O messenger of Allah, I have done with her illegally what a husband legally does with his wife. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was still not satisfied. He asked for further clarification. Oh Maiz, did you go into her? Did you go into her just like how the rope goes into the well? And just how like that stick goes into the surma dani, into that surma pot? He says, yes, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa this is what happened. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he orders that Maiz bin Malik be stoned to death. He is taken away by the companions. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is there. Maiz bin Malik is stoned to death. This is a companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He is stoned to death. And whilst he was being stoned to death, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu overheard two people talking. And they were saying to one another that look at this person, Maiz. Allah had concealed his sin, but he couldn't rest. He was restless until he went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu and confessed his sin. Now look at him. He is dying. He is being stoned like a dog is stoned. And they are backbiting about him. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi when the whole crew is going back home, after this stoning has taken place, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi passed by the corpse of a donkey. He called these two people and he said to them, come here. When they came, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi said to them, that eat from the corpse of this donkey. They said, oh Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi what sort of meal is this? Who would like to eat from the corpse of a donkey? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, What you said about your brother back there, the ghibah, the backbiting that you did about your brother back there, that is worse of a meal than eating from the corpse of this donkey. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu in relation to Maiz bin Malik, he said, That, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ إِنَّهُ الْآنِ I swear by that being in whose hands lies my life. I am looking at Maiz. I can see Maiz bin Malik at this moment in time. He is swimming in the rivers of Jannah. He is swimming in the rivers of paradise. And he said in another narration as related by Imam Muslim in Isai, he said to his companions, Oh my companions, Istaghfiru li Maiz ibn Malik. لَقَدْ تَابَ تَوْبَةً لَوْ قُسِمَتْ بَيْنَ أُمَّةٍ لَوَسِيَتْهُمْ that all my companions seek forgiveness for Maiz bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. For indeed, he has performed such repentance. He has performed such tawbah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That had his repentance been distributed amongst the whole ummah, la wasi'athum, it will be enough for every single person. So the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it knows no bounds. Imam Tirmidhi relates in his sunan, on the authority of Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala, a hadith a qudsi, qala Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qala Allah azza wa jal, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Ya ibn Adam, inna kama da'awtani, warajawtani, غَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي That O oh, Son of Adam, so long as you turn to me, so long as you have hope in me, then I will forgive you for whatever you have done and I will not mind. يَا بْنَ آدَمْ لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءَ ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرْتَنِي غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي O oh, Son of Adam, if you were to come to me with and your sins were to reach the clouds in the sky, 
you were to commit so many sins that they were to reach the clouds in the sky then i will forgive you for whatever you have done and i will not mind yabna adam inna kama ataitani yawma usuna adam if you were to come to me with a world full of sins bi qurabil ardi khataya you were to come to me with a world full of sins condition is that you didn't commit shirk condition is that you didn't ascribe any partners to me allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then i will grant you a world full of forgiveness but who is there today to ask for forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start from a clean slate before ramadan ask for forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincere repentance from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh allah forgive me and oh allah give me the strength to stay on the straight path give me istiqama on deen when the shaitan iblis When he was shown the red card from the heavenly kingdom he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh Allah I swear by your honor and I swear by your majesty as long as this son of Adam is alive I will keep leading him astray I will do everything in my power to lead every single human being astray and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him that oh iblis I swear by my honor I swear by my majesty that until this son of Adam keeps asking for forgiveness from me I will forgive him I will forgive I will forgive his sins So repent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make a resolution of changing your lives Ramadan is the time where we change our lives In the month of Ramadan we have the tarawih salah and it's unfortunate you know we can see it everywhere around us today it's an illness that has crept in within our youth and in fact within our elders too we see that we before ramadan starts we look for a masjid where the hafiz of the quran recites the fastest quran and we'll want to perform our tarawih salah there why get it over and done with fast this is the attitude and there'll be talk around the town how long does hafiz sahab take in the masjid in tarawih well our imam sahab takes about one and a half hours and we be absolutely shattered at the back <laughs> and the one says our imam sahab 40 minutes like an express train you know and this is the talk amongst our youth this is the talk amongst our elders and we look for a masjid where you know tarawi finished the fastest and you know nowadays you know a few years back there was a sign somewhere you know somebody told me uh, allah knows best to you know how true it is but there was a sign somewhere in blackburn and on the sign he said fastest tarawi in town only 30 minutes and the only was in capital letters as well fastest tarawi in town allahu akbar Look at the companions of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Umar bin Khattab radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu during his era when Ubay bin Ka'b radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu would lead the muslims in tarawih salah Allahu akbar the tarawih salah was so lengthy the sahaba say the tabi'in the successors of the sahaba they say that at times we had to take support from walk, from our sticks from our walking sticks to stay you know just standing This is how long the tarawih salah was at the time of Sayyidina Usman ibn Affan radiyallahu ta'ala anhu the tarawihs were so long again they needed sticks to for support because the tarawihs were so long and then the companion the tabi'in say that the tarawih salah would finish you know so close to the time of sahri end so close to the time of fajr salah that as soon as tarawih finished there was only little bit of time left so we used to order our servants to bring the food quickly why if sahri ends such little time left between between sahri and fajr suwaid bin ghafla rahimahullah taala he was a tabi'i you know he had met the sahaba he was a successor to the sahaba he came to the he came to madina He came to reside in Medina the day the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam left this world. Suwaid bin Ghafla he reached 
the age of 120, the ripe old age of 120. Even at this age of 120, he would lead the people in Tarawi Salah himself. He would lead the people in Tarawi Salah. And in each rakat, he would recite 30 verses of the Quran. How many verses? 30 verses of the Quran. And if you calculate that by 20 rakats, it's approximately three chapters, three paras of the Quran at the age of 120. Abu Raj'a Utaridi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, another Tabi'i. He also reached the age of 120. He himself says, He says that I was so frail and I was so weak that people would have to carry me from my home to the masjid and back. Even in that state, he would lead the people in Tarawi Salah. Even in that state. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because these people had a feel of the Quran. These people, when the Quran was recited on them, when the Quran was recited, they would buzz of the Quran. The Quran was their ecstasy. Every verse of the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the believers in the Quran. He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتَ لَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا The who are the believers? The believers are those people who are, that when Allah's name is mentioned before them, their hearts tremble. Today Allah's name is mentioned before us and what happens to us? It doesn't have any effect on us. And I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying Allah once, saying Allah, saying Allah just once is better than the world and whatever it contains. Whatever it contains. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the verses of the Quran, when the ayat of the Quran are recited for the believers, what happens to them? Zadatum imana. The iman increases. Each one of you sitting here today, look into yourselves. That when we are standing in Tarawi Salah, are we listening to the recitation? Are we pondering upon the recitation or is our mind somewhere else? Is our Iman increasing? What is happening to our Iman? Because Allah is saying the believers are those whose Iman increases when the verses of the Quran are recited before them. Is our Iman increases? Increasing. Oh, our dreams increasing in Tarawi. What's happening to us? So respected brothers and elders, take this Ramadan as if it's your last Ramadan. Value this Ramadan and profit from this Ramadan as if it's your last Ramadan. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah grants us this ability and Allah grants us this tawfiq that we can fully take benefit of the month of Ramadan. And we can make use of the month of Ramadan. Ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make a habit of recitation of the recitation of the Quran. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, some, the month of Ramadan, when the month of Ramadan comes, you know, a lot of us, you know, sometimes me included as well, you know, a lot of us get in this, you know, we get this uh, in us, yeah? You know, we go on this high and we'll pick up the Quran and we'll recite two paras and then the next day is nothing. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدَّ وَإِنْ That the most beloved act in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that act which is done consistently even though it's less. It's done consistently. No, you don't just recite two paras on the first of Ramadan and then nothing after that. But make a habit. That every day, whatever you can recite easily of the Qur'an. If you can recite two pages easily, if you can recite five pages easily, if you can recite one para easily, then recite that one para, but keep it consistent throughout the month of Ramadan. And those that do not know how to recite the Qur'an, make an intention and make a resolution that during the month of Ramadan, we are going to correct and we are going to learn how to recite the Qur'an. There are people today, pensioners today, they're going to evening classes to improve their English speaking skills. No. English speaking skills. I mean, what do you need English speaking skills at this age for? But they need it. 
And this is the Quran. The book of all books. Allahu Akbar. The book of all books. There is no other book on this planet. There is no other book on this planet. That you can look at and you will be rewarded. You recite and you will be rewarded. You listen to and you will be rewarded. You respect, you honor, you cherish and you will be rewarded except for the Quran. <coughs> this is our book. So learn how to those that don't know how to recite the Quran, make an intention and make a resolution. Alhamdulillah, you have young scholars here today. Alhamdulillah. And I'm so happy to see these young scholars. Alhamdulillah. And they're on the same level as you. You know, they're on the same understanding as you. And you will come to them. They will provide you with a good atmosphere, with a loving atmosphere. And they will teach you within this atmosphere. Inshallah. So there's nothing to be shy of. You know that I'm over age now. You know, I'm over 20 now. I'm over 30 now. You know, I don't want to make any... Uh, you know, I'm going to go in the class and, you know, uh, it's going to be embarrassing for me. What are people going to think? That look at him, you know, he's... Uh, he's come now to recite the Quran. What was he doing, you know, when he was 12 or 13? It's not like that. Look at the Sahaba, Allahu Akbar. The Sahaba, look how they memorize the Quran. You know, nowadays we have people in two years, three years, they become half of the Quran. With the Sahaba, it wasn't like that. What would the Sahaba do? The Sahaba would take one verse of the Quran at a time. And that one verse of the Quran, firstly, they would memorize it. They would master it. They would recite it with tajweed, with the correct, correct pronunciation. They would master his recitation. Then, then they would delve into the meaning of that verse. The inner meaning of that verse, the tafsir, the commentary of that verse. They would acquire that knowledge. Then they would practice on that verse. And then they would preach that verse to other people. Only then would they go on to another verse of the Quran. This is why it took Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma 12 years just to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. How many years? 12 years just to memorize Surah Baqarah, which is obviously the longest surah of the Quran, but it took him 12 years. And when he completed, you know, the Surah Al-Baqarah, Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he gave a huge feast to all the people. You know, goats were slaughtered and people gathered around and there had a dawah, they had a party because Umar Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu his son, Umar bin Khattab's son had finished the completion of Surah Al-Baqarah. So we should make an effort to come to the masjid and to rectify our Quran and to learn our Quran. Don't look at your age. Don't look at your age, what your age is. Inshallah, come and make an intention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy. Inshallah. So I complete on this. Conclude on this, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me the ability to understand what has been said, to act according to what has been said. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all your brothers the understanding and the ability and the tawfiq to act according to what has been said. Wa akhiru dawana an alhamdulillah. You cannot worship until you love. You cannot love until you feel. You cannot feel until you understand. Learn until you have been found Can't be found until you seek You will not seek nor find